Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Nirali and I'm currently a third year medical student who studies at Plovdiv Medical University in Bulgaria. So today's video is going to be something completely different and out of the box. So I actually got into touch with a friend of mine from my undergraduate days and we have decided to, I basically approached him and asked if he was willing to do a collab with me and um, basically compare our medical schools just so everyone is aware of what it's actually like to study abroad. So before we get into this video, make sure you subscribe, press the bell button and give this video a thumbs up. Um, today I have Habib joining me. So Habib, do you want to give a bit of an introduction about yourself? Yep. Um, so my name is Habib. I go by the IV line on all social media platforms. Um, I'm a fifth year medical student studying at the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. And me and Nirali know each other from... Undergrad all days. All yeah. Degree. So, yeah, let me just clarify that. Me and Habib actually did um, the same degree at the same institution back in 2013. So we've known each other... Yeah, 2013, long time ago, man. Damn. So we've known each other since 2013, all the way up until we've graduated. And we've kept in touch after we graduated as well, like you know, odd few high hellos here and there throughout the years. Um, Habib is actually a fifth year medical student in um, Cyprus at Nicosia Medical University. So um, what A-levels did you study um, back when you were applying initially for medical schools? Did you do A-levels? Did you do anything else? So um, I come from Tanzania and one of the other, apart from A-levels, something else that's offered there is the IB program, the International Baccalaureate. So, um, in the IB, you get to select six um, total subjects. So yes. I did, and you can, you have to do three higher level and three at a standard level. So my standard levels were language, which was Swahili, um, the local language back home. It was um, English and it was math. And my higher levels were chemistry, biology, and geography. Okay. And how are they all like graded? Because obviously with A-levels, it's like a grade per subject that you get. So is that is it the same thing over there or is it like a combined score? Yeah. So the IB, the IB is a weird... So we don't have the A's and B's and A stars. So you get a percentage in your exam. And if your percentage was, let's say, from um, 80 and above, you get a 7 out of 7. If you are between 70 and 80, you'd get a 6 out of 7. And that's how it works. So when you look at the final IB exam report, it will always be out of 42 because you have 6, uh, sorry, you have um, 6 subjects and you multiply by 7. So the max you can get is 42. So it's, okay. it's just, it's, it's a weird, um, what's it called? It's a weird way to think about it if you've always seen A stars and Bs, but yeah. yeah. So what, is there like a minimum school you need to study medicine? Yes. So the, it depends on which university, but the lowest I've seen it in the UK was I think 34, if I'm not mistaken. So you need a 34 mm -hmm. out of, so when you do your final, final year, instead of 42, the max ends up being 45 because there's three extra points that you can get from doing like your extended thesis type of um, different projects on the side, basically. Yeah. So to do medicine, you would have to get 34 or above at a minimum. So mm. it's like if you got 34, it'd be highly unlikely that you end up get, not getting into medicine, if that makes sense. Kind of have to hit the higher boundaries. Yeah, like you'd, you'd have to be in the upper 30s, 40s to like get into medical school, especially in the UK because of how competitive okay. it is. And if you're an okay. international student as well, it's just way more competitive. Okay, so um, which medical schools did you apply to and how many did you apply to? I didn't apply to the UK because I, A, I didn't think my grades were good enough. And even if they were, I wasn't willing to pay the fees that I would have had to pay. Um, so for an inter international student, the fees are, I think, 30,000 um, a year and above. And I think now it's worse. Like now it's 40,000 or 44,000 and a, a per, uh -huh. per year. This is just fees, not accommodation, not expenses, nothing. Wow. That, so, your, that one year tuition is almost the same as a full five year degree, like almost approximately. And also, um, 
Yeah, so I just didn't think I wanted to apply to the UK. So I just applied to European universities instead. And I only really yeah. applied to two of them. I only applied to University of Nicosia, which is this one, and one in Italy, which is called Humanitas um, in Milan. Okay. Yeah, both English universities. And you have to sit an exam for the one in Italy. And this one, this university replied to me first and like gave me an offer. And my father, okay. my father being a doctor, just said offers are hard to come by. So just take this one. Don't risk waiting for the Italy one, even though you want to go to Italy. So I ended up here. Um, when you were applying to Nicosia, did you apply through an agency or was it just like a, an application straight to the, uni um, to the university directly? Yeah, so it was a straight uh, from me to the university application. You fill, out a yeah. very, you fill out a quick form on the website that they then email you back asking you for some documents. You send those back, then they you get an offer to the interview. Um, you then sit the interview. It's a, I want to say like an online version of an MMI. Like a, it's a panel, it's a, you, you go into an interview with three to five people and each of them asks you a question, gives you a scenario, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, after that, then you move on. But no, I didn't, there, there was no agencies from when I was applying and I don't think there still is for Cyprus at, at least. So it was all just me. See, that's, I think that's one thing that I like that everything is already, you just gotta just submit your documents onto like an online por portal or like to the professor's you know, to the the admissions department, basically, and that's it. Whereas here in Bulgaria, it's kind of a lengthy process because you have to get all your documents translated and then legalized. And then obviously, if you're doing that for each certificate, it gets really expensive. So we do have agencies here that help us kind of um, through that whole application process, help us with the entrance exam that we have to sit as well. But obviously, again, that's another cost that you will have to kind of pay for regardless of if you choose to come through an agency or not and i think some agencies are a lot cheaper than directly going and getting each document notarized and legalized and whatnot yeah, so, yeah I, whatnot. Had, I had to do that um yeah. especially because i was in tanzania when i applied doing, because it was during summer so we don't yeah. have like anything in the uk where you can just take everything to one person and they notarize it for you yes. you have to go to the ministry of health for your health paperwork you have to go to the ministry of education for your education paperwork so wow. it, was, it was all it, it was a hassle like to be fair it was a it was a hassle but it, it got done so um what was your reason to study abroad um so as i said because i'm from tanzania the universities there i didn't think I would have a good opportunity because I want to eventually just end up working somewhere in Europe or in the US. And this was my mentality back then. And I yeah. didn't think graduating from a uh, university in Tanzania would give me that added benefit. Now, mm. now looking back at it, it was very narrow minded thinking from my side because now I know people from my country who can easily apply. But as a young person, at like um, as a teenager, I was like, OK, uh, university from Africa, you, you probably won't get like a good op op opportunity to go work abroad, if that makes sense. So yeah. initially I thought, okay, no, I need to go to a European university, a UK university or like somewhere in America. Yeah. And yeah, so I, when I was, when, when we were in Coventry, as I said, once I realized that UK was not really an option, I was like, okay, so Europe, I'll look into Europe. Like I haven't heard any bad things about it. And a medical school exactly. at the end of the yeah. day is just a medical school. So <laughs> yeah, I think people have a lot of misconceptions about european medical schools for some reason i don't know why um i don't know if you've ever personally f had comments thrown at you but i get comments on the daily about how because we have and we will be talking about the like entrance um the requirements that you need but basically in bulgaria they they are significantly less than what you would need in like the uk f by a mile um and people assume that because the entrance exam entrance uh, requirements sorry are lower that medical school is easy and it's just such such a shock when you come here with those assumptions and you're actually in school and you realize that holy crap this is actually going to kill me like it's literally yeah. gonna kill you like that's how much I think pressure there is because you gotta pass so many subjects in one go and just, I think just the whole stress of it people just underestimate it I think sometimes a little bit um, with studying abroad like they feel as if it's not on the same wavelength as a UK a medical degree even though both our degrees are GMC accredited exactly so like the, if the if the governing body in the UK thinks that our degrees are enough for us to be able to work in the UK what's the problem there 
what's the problem exactly yeah. and, and like there's we're not going to sugarcoat and lie and say we get the same clinical exposure as people in the uk we probably don't and language barrier does play a role as well sometimes but mm -hmm. it's not that we don't get any clinical exposure we get a decent amount of clinical exposure, speaking on my behalf like we get a decent amount of clinical yeah. exposure and it's just like the comments come from i think a very um backwards like mentality that used to be there i think like a few years ago when medical schools in europe were not seen and in like the brightest light type of situation whereas now they're yeah. becoming very famous a lot of people are applying outside mm -hmm. so yeah okay so let's talk about the application process so like i like i mentioned before in bulgaria you have to apply through different agencies so what did you think of your entire application process like and how would you rate it out of a 10 10 being super easy amazing one being difficult would not recommend i'd say i'd, I'd give it like a 7.5 like it wasn't especially if you are applying from like the uk for example it's not going to be that hard because you literally just have to go to one person to get things notarized so when i so when you first apply, you tell them like basic information about your information about yourself, and um, they then ask you for paperwork. And the paperwork they ask you for is the basics, like your passport scan, your uh, transcript, all the other paperwork, like um, um, other degrees you've done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then yeah. they ask you like when you when you're actually like sending in your paperwork, like for the proper application, like now they you want them to like consider you as a student, etc. They ask you to notarize. Uh, the paperwork and again you just have to go to one person get it all notarized you need to get a police check as well i think and that can be done online in the uk online exactly yeah. whereas i had to go to the police station back home to get one, <laughs> to get one. Oh wow exactly. it's it's a very it's different depending on where you're coming from so if you're yeah. coming from a country that's not developed it's developing and all these things are not done online i would give the rating like a five but knowing that like i had help from my dad he had contacts to like speed up my process for me etc i can give it a 7.5 so it's it's not difficult it's just a hassle i agree yeah so with me out of 10 i would say i would give it about the same 7.5 um i had a pretty smooth sailing like application process um the agency like i said handled everything for me they just asked for again basic documentation so like my um home address my passport details like um they also ask for like a health record which is I think pretty standard at any institution that you apply to um and a i don't remember if they asked for a police check but i will double check that i don't think they did um and all i had to do was submit it and then they asked me for my a level certificates my degree certificates and that was literally it all they had to do was basically just translate and notarized that they did all that for me submitted to the doc uh to the university and yeah they were basically like okay so you have initial acceptance now you just need to book your entrance exam and wait for the final ranking which comes out in september for your full acceptance so again pretty smooth sailing but i know some people who do have it a lot more difficult because of the type of degrees like i believe we have students here from like india who need to do, who have like a completely different application process because they need to do the Indian medical school um, entrance exam before they can apply here apparently. Um, so it's like a whole different process for them compared to what it is for just UK students. When it comes to the application process, I think obviously like the UK just seems to be much straightforward because you you don't yeah. need that many different people. Or... UCAS is so easy to use. Like yeah. it's so easy. Once you get the hang of it, it's just such a smooth sailing like application process um, software. Like you just, you literally just pick your five unis, your five subjects, pay the 26 pounds fee and then that's it. Okay, so let's get into talking about the actual curriculum at medical school. So what subjects did you learn during your first year at medical school? Yeah, so our med school is six years. So the first year um, from, after speaking to like my friends and colleagues, we, we kind of agree that like a first year is a year that they want to have everyone on the same level. And yeah, same. Yeah, so the first year was, is basic subjects. Like uh, we had biology, chemistry, we had medical ethics, um, we had physics, et cetera, et cetera. Just the basics, basics. And there was no like biochemistry in first year. Like we didn't have pharmacology, nothing like that. It was just pure IB, A-level um biology chemistry nothing to do with medicine the only medical aspect was 
the ethics part where they like started teaching us about good practice and physics where they were teaching us about like um, how CT scans and MRIs work, even though we had never seen one before. But it was just like to get us around the idea of how it works. Yeah. But yeah, first year was just like to put everyone on the same level. Yeah, same. So in Bulgaria, we ha- it's the same principle. Again, six year degree. But for some reason, they want everyone to be on the same kind of platform in first year. So it's very like basic subjects. I'm talking exactly the same. So biology, chemistry, medical physics, biophysics. Um, We even had PE. We had regular PE to go to in first year, which was just like, I felt like I was in primary school. Um, The only, I would say, medical subjects that we had. So they they, uh, made us take anatomy for a whole year in first year. And um, for half a semester, we had another subject called CHE, which is cytology, histology, and embryology. So I would say those were the only two like actual medical subjects we learned whereas everything else was just to make sure everyone kind of had a basic science understanding but even in our second year i would say it's not very medical subjects because our first and second year are are pretty much the pre-clinical years um so second year we had the i would say the advanced stages of the first year subjects so we had like biochemistry physiology anatomy two um again very basic we had like social medicine medicine and ethics things like that um not very medically i would say but just so again everyone has the same kind of background knowledge and foundation to start on our second year was also a full year of anatomy a full year of physiology a full year of biochemistry and we also had our oskies started in second year so we had common skills and clinical skills and so from second year, we started learning how to speak to patients. We had simulated patients. Um, mm. We learned how to do like the basics of like vital signs, how to take vital signs. That's when, oh, wow. we, that's when we also had to pass our basic life support um, exam. Um, mm. So we got, we got certified for that. And then we learned like the, the basics of like examinations, so, like the cardiovascular examination, respiratory, abdominal, etc. But mm. so that, so it felt more transitioning towards like a medical medical degree medical degree yeah so like we were you were you would already and they would give us place we wouldn't have placements every day but you'd have placements every once every month or two where you just go randomly to a doctor's like clinic or uh, to the hospital and you just shadowed the doctor for the day just to give mm. you a feel of how it how it works so it wasn't like a placement it was just more like a shadowing experience to slowly oh, ease you into it yeah oh i wish we had something like that here but here you literally don't step foot in hospital until your third year. Um, and that's when it all kind of starts for us here. Okay, so next question. How many subjects did you have per semester in your first year? First semester, I think it was four. And then second semester? It was four. I th- it was either four and four or five and five. So did, you, did any of the subjects be like a year long subject? Were any of the subjects like just for yeah. one semester? So most of them are uh, full year. So for example, biology was full year. Chemistry was full year. Physics was full year. Ethics became sociology. So like ethics would change it to sociology. And then there was one more we did in first year, which I can't, which I can't really remember. But I'll send you like a photo that you can put up on screen if you want. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of the similar here. We have like year-long subjects like anatomy chemistry no anatomy biology um and then we had like semester ones which were like chemistry medical physics biophysics cytology histology embryology was like one semester um so it kind of just depends but we did have the full year-long ones as well um which kind of broke it up a little bit but it was also quite nice because once you're over that one subject in first semester, you kind of look forward to something new and different in your second semester, yeah. which was quite nice. Okay, so let's talk about the general exam structure. So what is like the general exam structure in the first year? Okay, so our exams are mainly, so in the first year it's all written exam. There's no, there's no oral exam. We, uh, we don't have oral exams unless it's an OSCE exam. Um, so we, our exams are multiple choice mainly, uh, we call them SBAs, single best answer, and some questions will have um, short answer, some, some exams will have short answer questions at the end, but like 5% of the exam would be short answer questions. Mainly all of them are just multiple choice, and we used to have midterms, well at least when I was in first year, I don't know if they've changed it now, but we, we'd have midterms, so if the semester started in um, 
uh, September. We'd have a midterm in around mid-November time. And okay. then our final exam for that semester would be in January or before Christmas holiday. So your, your midterm made up for, I think, 30% of your entire grade, and then your final exam would be the other 70. Some classes yes. have projects like essays, presentations, but it's like very few, like um, it was psychology in second year, I think, or first year that you had to do a presentation and counted for like a 10% of your mark. So th there's a whole different structure, but main, main, main exam is just written multiple choice exam. Okay, so kind of similar, not, not exactly similar, but over here in Bulgaria, it's, I don't know why, but they choose to have, for the main exams for certain subjects, they choose to have three different stages and you need to pass each stage to go into the next one. Um, and then the final stage, if, you know, if the department is willing to have that, there is an oral exam. So essentially, for example, in anatomy, anatomy and like cytology, histology and embryology in your first year, you have an MC, you start off with a practical exam. Okay. So you walk into a room and you'll have like cadavers or like histological slides, whatever. And you need to get 60% uh -huh. out of whatever the total is. So if there's 20 points, you need 60% to pass on to the uh, next stage. The next stage after practical is MCQs. Um, again, 60% you need to pass and then you go into the essay stage. Once you do the essays, they kind of mark it and then you come in the next day to either see if you've got an oral exam to find out if you've passed or to find out if you've failed, basically. Um, oh, wow. So it is such a daunting like yeah. process because once you do once you do practical you're kind of just hanging around waiting with all your friends and you're waiting for like at least an hour because the professors are marking all the papers so you're waiting for them and then they will call out names of all the people that have failed and you oh. then pick up your little your little book that has all your marks in it and then you go home and then yeah so it is it's such a daunting experience because you're all just sitting there waiting to to see basically if you failed or passed um but we do have mid midterms too we don't call them midterms here we call them colloquiums i don't know why they call them colloquiums um but each subject pretty much has a colloquium so anatomy in first year in the entire year there's six colloquiums three for first semester three for second now with certain subjects you can gain something called exemptions here so in anatomy if you have like an 80 percent for the whole year you don't do the practical part of the exam. You only do okay. MCQs and essays. But if you have a 90% average, you only sit the essay part of the final exam. Okay. But it kind of defers. But if anyone wants to see what an in-depth review is like at Bul in Bul medical universities in Bulgaria, you know, I'll leave the link down below in the description so you guys can see, because I'm not going to get into like the full breakdown here. Oh wow, that's that's like a whole Hogwarts type of examination. Yeah, experience. trust me. Wow, like... I've never heard of anything like that. Obviously, because of COVID, we can't have these exams. You can't have that yeah. many people hanging around in the auditorium. Um, so we're quite lucky now because now all our exams are MCQs or short answers, and they're all online, which is not a problem. But for some subjects like surgery, you have an MCQ, then you have an essay, and then you have an oral exam, oh, wow. and the head of department is just so tough. Like, imagine passing all of that and you get to the oral and she fails you. And then what happens? Do you do the oral part again or do you have to do everything again? I think, yeah, so you just come in for the oral part again. So, yeah, like, the stage you fail at is the stage you continue from, basically. Which is good, because imagine sitting that whole exam again. Like, no chance. Um, but, yeah, so the that's the kind of general exam structure, I would say, in Bulgaria. Okay, so next question is, um, what was your timetable like in first year? So the reason I'm asking this is, this is a common question I get asked by people who want to apply to Bulgaria. Yeah, so University of Nicosia, it's, I don't know how your university is placed, but in our university, everything is nearby. So we are in a small town in Nicosia. So it's, it's a, the main city is Nicosia, but we're like in a little area called Engomi. And that's like a very student, it's like Coventry based, just imagine a student city, basically. Oh, yeah. And it's like the university in the middle and all these student accommodations where usually every first year student goes to 
are around the university. So even if you end up having like a 45 minute break or like an hour long break, you can always go home to get things done and then go back to university. Mm. But overall, our in first, in first year, my timetable was you'd start at like 9 a.m. and we'd be done by like 2 p.m., 3 p.m. And then there are some days where it went from 9 till 5. It rarely went to 6, but then there'll be days where like 9 to 11, 9 till 12. Mm. Especially, especially when you have days where you have subjects like um, histology, for example, or you have um, chemistry um, tutorial sessions. If you're a big group, they break you into, if you're a big cohort, they break you into groups. So if you can imagine there's like group A, B, C, D, and there's only one professor to teach the subject, you go at nine and then you finish at 11, and then the other group goes at 11, finishes at one, the other one goes at one, finishes, blah, 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 that type of thing. So first year did not feel like, oh my God, I have no time to myself. Like you could, you, you, were, you, were, you were done by like 4 p.m. I would say similar, yeah, so similar kind of thing here, except we, I don't know why, but Bulgarians like to start at 7.30. Again, like sometimes the longest they will have is like 7.30 to like five, but that's not continuous teaching. We'll probably have like a random three hour gap in the middle, basically. Um, or we'll have like nine to twos or nine to fives or like 12 to two or like sometimes literally like in, in my second year, I think literally, I had one class on the Monday at 4.30. Oh, wow. So it, it literally varies. But yeah, Bulgarian universities love to start at... Well, I don't know about others, but Plovdiv loves to start at 7.30. And is attendance compulsory? Oh, um, yeah. So some of them did. Yeah. So they'll come in with like a piece of paper. You know how it was in Coventry where they have like a booklet and then you got to find your faculty number and name and sign. Yeah. So we had that here, but... It never used to really work because you'd have like 30 people show up and then like a hundred signatures. Like, so <laughs> it never used to work. Um, so not a lot of professors used to use that kind of method. I think only one or two did, but again, it backfired. But they're a lot more stricter now because it's online and they can easily just screenshot the attendance list because you can't sign other people in. Do you get what I mean? Okay, next question. What is the social aspect like in Cyprus. So I tell this to everyone who asks me who's, who wants to come to Cyprus and says like, there is a little bit of everything for everyone. And when I say that, it's like, if you are someone who's into activities like rock climbing, for example, you're not gonna have the abundance of rock climbing venues like you will in the UK. There's like maybe two rock climbing places in our city, for example. So it's like- yeah. So just like, obviously that's like a very extreme example, but it's just to give someone the idea of like, if you enjoy bowling, don't expect to have a bowling alley, like in five different corners of your town. There's like one bowling alley in our student okay. city. So that type of thing. And if you are an introvert, like I am, there's um, introvert like quotations, but like, if you enjoy just going to coffee shops, that's very big in Cyprus, like coffee shop in every corner. I'm not even kidding. Every corner, there's a coffee shop. So you literally, you can go to coffee shop, work there with your laptop. If you're into like nightlife, there's a big nightlife like scene in Cyprus as well. So there's a little bit of everything. And if you get into an activity, just don't expect to have crazy like choices. It's like very limited. Yeah, I would say the same as well. Like Plovdiv, even though we are the second biggest city in Bulgaria, it is quite a small city in my opinion. Um, we have the main university campus and then everything within a certain radius is available to you. So like you said, like the bowling alley, we have like one bowling alley. We have like snooker places and like restaurants and stuff. Like town is filled with them. And like you said, coffee shops, literally we have a coffee shop on every single corner too here. Like, or like a little mini, you know, um, outdoor seating kind of thing that we have. But um, yeah, it's, it's quite limited in terms of there's only one of everything so you, you we do get quite bored here quickly but does your university or do you have like student associations that organizes trips for you guys outside of the student areas so so i am an introvert so i don't really go to these like oh let's go hiking let's go see these mountains and i'm like okay now i wish because i'm into photography more i would i should have done that but whatever but it's like you have association not associations these students what's the word uh, student society where they organize yeah. these trips to like a different city um whenever like we have a carnival in cyprus every year where like 
don't know if that happens. I don't know if that happens everywhere in Europe. Or it's just like a Cypriot thing, but like a carnival where like thousands of thousands of people show up dressed up in like different costumes. You just walk oh, wow. down the main like beach road and like it's just like a big party. So like they organize a trip to their there's like the big um, party town in Cyprus called Ayanapa. Every British citizen goes there. And like you, ha- you, ha- you have to go there. So it's like they organize trips to that. So there is a society that um, that um, organizes all these things. But if they didn't, Cyprus is so small. Driving from one end of Cyprus to the other end takes like two and a half hours. So it's just like you could always just organize yourself with your friends, hire a car and rent a car and just go. Same here. So we do have like student organizations that run these like trips around Bulgaria for us, um, like day trips or like three day trips or whatnot. So we have like, the un- we have this like annual ski trip for three days every year at the end of February. Or we have like different like day trips down to the coast of Bulgaria as well. Because I think because we're quite in the middle of Bulgaria to go to either end of the coast, it's like three hours, maybe four for us. So it is doable for us in a sense, if you leave early enough in a day, you can kind of do a huge day trip and then make it back on time. But yeah, it's quite quite nice that they do have these organizations that run these trips for us. Otherwise we would literally be bored out of our minds here with nothing to do. How often do you go back home? So to Tanzania, um, whilst you're in university? Um, I go back every summer. I used to go back during Christmas, but as the years progressed, so once I think I got to year three, because of how difficult year three was, I just didn't see the point. But I go back once a year because traveling to Tanzania takes a full day. So like it's a 19 hour yeah. trip. So I oh. I try to limit, even though like I miss home, I miss family, etc. I, I can't be bothered to travel for a full day. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And it must be expensive as well. Like a 19 hour trip is not going to be cheap. Uh, I think it's a thousand five hundred both ways, so total. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's it's quite expensive as well. So, with obviously because Bulgaria is still in Europe, where majority of us are from Europe, so either Italy, Greece, Germany, or the UK, you know, the max amount of time it takes us is probably from here to the UK, which is like a three-hour flight. Um, and as you know, like yeah, like we can travel, and it's one way. You don't have to take like two different flights or whatever um and everyone pretty much uses like Ryanair or like another airline called Wizz Air and we literally students here I know people that have been going home like every month oh wow yeah (laughs) literally every month for either like three days four days a week because this semester because of covid our academic timetable has been on a rotation so we have two weeks in person two weeks online so some students for the weeks that we have online will go home for the full two weeks that they're supposed to be at home um so it's been a lot more relaxed this year but in first year i would say i would say people go home quite frequently as well because we have a lot of like random national holidays too and they always conveniently fall either on a friday or a monday so you can have a longer weekend kind of thing yeah so yeah people do kind of depends again because again i get asked this question a lot like how many times do you go home? I think people think that we're held like prisoner here or something. Um, and they don't realize that, you know, it's totally dependent on when you want to go, how much you miss your family, do you have the time, how much work do you have, etc., etc. Like, you yeah, exactly. Like, for me, this semester, our semester started in February. I still haven't gone home yet. And one, it's because there's just too much work. And I know the second I step foot in the UK, the work will just leave my mind because the UK is home. It's not university anymore for me. So work just leaves my mind completely. Um, And three, obviously with all these COVID restrictions in place, it's so expensive paying for these like PCR tests and this test and this test. And I'm just like, you know what? It's just not worth it. I'll just wait to go home like once exams are over. Last and final question is how long is your exam season? So when does it start? When does it finish? And how many exams do you have in in a typical exam season? So I'll try to remember as far back as year one. But when when our exams start, they usually end within two weeks, two to two two weeks to our two and a half weeks. So we we okay. we start an exam on Monday. 
And keep in mind, our exam is just that one off like exam. So it's like you yeah. sit that one exam, you leave, you're done. So it's Monday, and then you'd get like Tuesday off, Wednesday off, and then you have your next exam on Thursday. And then you'd get Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then the next exam would be on Monday. And then same until you finish all. So if you have five subjects, it'd take two, uh, two and a half weeks. If you have four subjects, it'd take two weeks. Um, okay. I want to say three weeks because they give us like four days in between or three days for our OSCE exam. So like they give us time to prepare, etc. So I'd yeah. say three weeks. But like for um, my coming exam in July, we start our exams on the 5th of July and we finish on the 22nd of July because we have six, no, three exams, but like four different modules, three different modules, like cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, etc. Yeah. And then we have four days in between for OSCEs. So okay. three weeks, I'd say. Man, I'm so jealous. Our exam yeah. season is like eight weeks long. Yeah, when you when you were telling me about how many different exams you have to sit, I was just imagining how long. Cause like literally eight weeks. Because you know when exam dates... Okay, I don't know about you, but anxiety for me during exam starts hitting a week before exam. Yeah. Yeah. A week before exam, it's like, okay, heart rate, just baseline just increases to like tachycardia and you're just there like, okay, exam season is here. But then yeah. for eight weeks to be in that constant state of... Trust, trust me. So we, this year, third year is like the make it or break it year at Plovdiv because we have two compulsory subjects that you have to pass in order to go into fourth year. And that's general surgery and internal medicine. So when it comes to just general exams, a brief kind of like breakdown of it. So you have your first sitting in June or July. Then you have a reset period at the end of July, a reset period at the beginning of September, and then something we call a liquidation period at the mid end of September. So let's say you fail your first sitting. So then you can either choose to reset in July or September. You can only pick one. If you fail that, we have liquidation period, which is basically the last chance you have for that academic year to pass that exam. Okay. So if you get to the liquidation stage and you still fail either general surgery or internal medicine, you fail the year, you have to basically reset that subject. So for us, it's so, so nerve wracking because not only on top of that, we've also got like seven other exams to do as well and the way the institutions like it here is to have one exam technically per week basically um and some exams will be like for for example pathophysiology because of the structure of our exams which are like practical mcq oral la 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 you can't have 260 people sit that exam on one day so they like to split us up into batches of like five groups of like which has like maybe 12 people each in it. And then you'll go in at 7.30 and then the exam will finish by two. So you're literally there for like six, seven hours. It's basically the length of a USMLE step one exam. Can you believe that? Just for one one subject. (laughs) So I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of your university, when you get to the clinical years, do you have Mm -hmm. like a set of things that you need to complete to pass each clinical year? Like, do you, a a task list or something? Yeah, so we have, we get given the syllabus um, from the first week of university. And it it basically has everything that you will cover. For example, in internal medicine, we started off with um, just basic history taking. You spend like, I think two weeks, just not even two weeks, probably like a week, learning how to take history, what you should look out for, learn about like general inspection palpation etc and then we moved on to respiratory um and then after respiratory we had like a mini colloquium and then we moved on to cardiovascular currently we're doing gastrointestinal okay fair enough sorry one more question um what are your tuition fees like at your university Mm. so the so as i said we are six years divided into three and three so the first mm-hmm. three years, each year is 18 grand, 18, 18, 18. And then mm-hmm. the th- last three years is 22, 22, 22. Why, why does it differ? Like, how come it's not just like a set price for you guys? I think because once we, once you move into your four, five and six, 
um, mm. it they take into account like the uni- hospital like um, insurance fees and all these different things. Um, okay. I, like I, I wish we had like a proper breakdown of like the proper fees, like why it's increasing. But the only thing that's changing is that we go from being university students in classroom to hospital students. So like the last time I was in a lecture room was two years, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Because okay. we're we're fully just in the hospital from seven a.m., eight a.m. until four p.m. Just hospital, yeah. hospital, hospital. So I guess it's to pay the hospital fees or something, insurance, malpractice, blah blah blah. blah. So um, in Bulgaria, it is a lot cheaper than what you're paying in Cyprus. We pay like 8,000 euros per year from first to sixth year. Um, so it, there's no like changes in price for us. Like after third year, it's still the same price. Um, I think that's why it attracts a lot of UK students here in particular because of the low cost in pounds. Um, but again, like I think it just depends on the institution because I think... I think there's some universities in Romania that charge like 5,000 euros. Okay. Yeah, so, I think yeah, it kind of just de- depends on your institution in general and I guess what country you're on. Like, I want to add something you said early on into the video and it links in with the fees is that we really need to get this point across to students who are thinking of applying to European med schools. And okay. the fact that two, I think the two factors they probably look at is oh, their fees are so low and their entry requirements are so low. So this must be like a very easy university to like whatever. What people need to keep in mind is at the end of the day, universities are businesses. And there's a reason to why their fees are so low is because they're trying to attract you. And once you get Mm -hmm. into first year, they've made a profit of over 10,000 euros, like 8,000 euros. And if you fail that first year and you leave, they're not going to care if... Nirali or Habib left like you're gonna be the one who ends up being sad they don't care they got 8,000 euros from you for nothing so even though the requirements are low and and I don't want to say low low the requirements are not the same as the UK you still need to have a certain level and Mm -hmm. you and the fees are so low please ask yourself if you are willing to put in the work that is required once you get into your three your, your two and above your three and above I'd say because yeah. it gets quite, quite hectic. Once you get to exactly. third year and above, you're basically a yeah. medical student, just like you are anywhere in the world. I think that's where people kind of, that's where they're kind of like, they have tunnel vision because they think, oh, low entrance requirements, low fees, that's a shit university, I'm not going there. Um, and they kind of just push it aside, like, okay, that's out of the question for me. but. Yeah, again, universities are businesses. All they care about is getting that bag. Like, they don't care about anything else. Like, And just to add to what you said about, like, when people look at these universities and think, oh, European, they're outside the UK, blah, blah, It's just like, take it from someone who's currently in fifth year, and I know people who are in sixth year, who, when we attend, like, these conferences or these online teachings, uh, and we have, like, we go, like... It's not a competition, but we're like head to head with like British students, like from universities in the UK. We are on par with each other. Like, yeah. as I said, there may be some some instances where you may be lacking in some clinical skills, but that is it. All you need is some experience. So for our yeah. university, if um, for fifth and sixth year, if you're a British citizen, you can apply to do your fifth and sixth year in the UK um, okay. and, and you get to do it in Barnsley. So there's a limited number of spaces available. So you, it, it's like a you get lucky type of thing. So my girlfriend, she's there in sixth year. She's graduating. Well, she, yesterday was her last day of as a medical student. But wow. So you do like two years in Barnsley. And according to her and people from there, it's just that the knowledge is there. And clinical skills wise, speaking on behalf of like University of Nicosia, it's like you have good clinical skills. It's just learning how the NHS system works how different referrals work, etc. Yeah, I agree with that. I think speaking to former six like former students here who have now who are now FY1 or FY2 doctors in the UK, I think the one thing that they kind of push on is make sure you get the UK experience because at the end of the day, we're not planning to settle in the countries we're studying in. We're planning to move to a whole new like system and obviously the the way the nhs is run is so different to the way the medical system here in bulgaria is run so i think it's more learning about the administrative ways of the nhs rather than 
learning about medical stuff in the NHS because I think worldwide medical a medical degree is a universal degree you know essentially we're, we're all learning the same systems the same like um methods the same like How different like, can asthma be from america to australia it's the exactly same thing like, like exactly like it's exactly the same like you know you're not learning about different we all have the same body there's you can't teach different things about it you get what i mean but the things that um, may differ are like uh guidelines as you said like knowing that okay in the uk every hospital has like an analgesia ladder like this hospital may use yeah. this first or like a um um antibiotic ladder like oh this hospital will yeah. use this but this hospital so it's like all these things you will only learn once you like start working but you need to start as a medical student thinking about how things work in the uk so like learn learn your a to e approach like learn what to assess from a to e check out the new score all these things in the uk like you don't want to go as your first day as a doctor and you're being asked what's this patient's new score and you're just there like what's what's news uh, exactly i think you need to learn about the system of your home country or wherever you plan to go after you graduate um and worry less about the degree type obviously make sure your degree qualification is recognized in the country you want to go to like there's no point in doing a medical degree if your home country or the country you want to go to will not recognize the medical degree i'm gr like i think we're both grateful in a sense that both our degrees are gmc accredited and a lot of students from either like bulgaria romania cyprus they go australia they go new zealand or they go to the united states so it's quite a universal universally accredited degree here i would say as well and i think that's one of the advantages um um compared to like elsewhere um yeah. so yeah the just to put it out there like the gmc accredits our degree for a reason they're not just doing it for banter like you know as a final tip from someone who's graduating like in a year's time is that we have the knowledge what we will probably be lacking on if maybe if, if maybe even not is the clinical skills so when you're in hospitals try go above and beyond to get that clinical skill experience so the things you'll be doing you'll be doing mainly as a junior doctor is you'll be taking bloods you'll be doing cannula, cannulas you'll be taking vital signs all these things and even the vital signs the nurses may do that but just make sure you're comfortable if you ever get asked during an a to e situation yeah. if the doctor says oh can you just quickly take the blood pressure for me you don't want to be like oh how does how how does the cuff go on like that type of thing be, be comfortable mm -hmm. with your cannulas and every patient you see just put yourself in the mindset of okay i'm a junior doctor how am i going to like take care of this patient like do i need to mm -hmm. make sure they're alive first like a to e approach all these different it's things that people seem to neglect and a lot of people think oh once i have my medical degree uh, i'm a doctor like i can do everything like well no it's not no, you, you have that's to not the get case. this exactly i spoke to yeah. someone i think from who graduated from Plovdiv, if I'm not mistaken, she's a doctor now in the UK, and she said that's one of the biggest things that students in university think, which is they think once you get the degree, you're a doctor, and now you just, you'll just automatically learn how to do things. But you don't want to no. start learning how to do things on real, actual patients when you're a junior doctor. You'd rather practice yeah. as a student with supervision. Also, just another tip, if you're not, if you feel like you're not getting enough of the clinical exposure in classrooms, then ex find it externally because yeah even if you have to pay for it like i decided to do a phlebotomy course last summer basically um and i paid like 200 pounds for that but it was still experience that i got outside of university because i felt like maybe i wasn't obviously because of covid we've not been going into the hospitals as, as much so i can't poke and prod my friends you know what i mean so i that's why i decided to get that exposure outside that and that 200 yeah. pounds will go such a long way exactly so that's another pro tip for anyone watching is if you feel like you're not confident enough or you're you know you, you don't have time in university to do it find the external um solution to that problem basically is what i'm saying that was a pretty decent chat um, to anyone watching, if you guys do have any specific questions about what it's like to study in Cyprus or what it's like to study in Bulgaria, I will link Habib's um, YouTube channel and his socials down below also in the description. But if you have any comments, you know, leave them down below and I will pass them on to Habib um, so he can reply to specific ones. But yeah, you can go and slide into his DMs and ask him questions about specific points about Cyprus if you felt as if certain things weren't covered here. 
Um, so yeah, also make sure you subscribe to both our channels and like this video and press the bell button basically. But yeah, um, I hope everyone has a pleasant week and we will see you next time. Stay safe, everyone.